Gardeners know all about the importance of bees, butterflies and other beneficial insects in the garden. But when it comes to moths, well, most of us are a bit in the dark. So I've come to the Melbourne Museum to shed some light on these interesting and I think beautiful, but elusive creatures. I love moths because they are the underdog of the insect world. They really are unseen and unloved, uh, really. Whereas if you begin to understand them and you begin to see the variety, they're the unsung heroes of the Australian fauna. So Ken, what is the difference between a moth and a butterfly? Jane, that's an interesting question. It's a human division between moths and butterflies. In nature, it doesn't really work. But in theory, there's a number of differences. First thing is that butterflies fly during the day, but moths fly at night. But there are day flying moths as well. One of the other really big differences is the antennae. In moths, they have very feathery antennae, whereas butterflies have just got a single antenna there. There's about 400 species of butterflies and 11,000 species of moths in Australia. Now, we don't think that we're going to find many more butterflies, but that 11,000 is probably more like 20 or 30,000 species of moths. Worldwide, there's about 160,000 species of moths and less than 20,000 species of butterflies. Moths do an awful lot of pollination. They really are the powerhouse. The other thing is that about 60% of our birds feed on insects and a main part of their diet is moths. So pollinators, and food sources for vertebrates. Also, lizards eat them and spiders eat them, a whole range of other animals. So they really are the food source for many other animals out there, but they're an extremely important part of our ecosystems. Come on, Jane, over here, let's have a look at some of the moths oh, I've got out. I love these old drawers. Wow, what is this one? This is called the Hercules moth, and it's the largest moth in the world, which we have in Australia. The female has got a wingspan of about 30 centimetres. She's and here's the male with the long tail down there. And where from? These are from North Queensland, about cool. Mackay, all the way up to Cairns and into the Cape and that. Oh, they um, beautiful markings. These are the cossid moths or the witchetty grubs. Oh. These have got the big caterpillars and they are enormous moths. Often God. I've heard people say that when they see them on the ground, they think that they're a mouse or a rat. And this is a beauty. Uh, wow. These are hawk moths. They are tremendous pollinators and they act a little bit like hummingbirds. They can actually sit above the flower and with the long proboscis put into the long, deep tubular flower. But they are tremendous pollinators, hawk moths. Oh, now we know what these are. Ah, the emperor gum <laughs> moth. Emperor gum moth. Very yeah. nice, so yeah. very, very good. And the really interesting thing about the emperor gum moth are these two big eye spots mm. at the back there. That's designed, if they are attacked by a predator, they can flare them up and it makes it look as though the head or the mm. eyes are really, really big, so much bigger mm. than what the predator thought. And hopefully, it's enough to confuse it and the moth gets away, yes. Now, these ones, what are they? This is the bogon moth. Most people seem to think the bogon moth is quite a large moth, but you can see it's about, exactly. It's, it's not as It's quite tiny, but they fly all the way from southeast Queensland, New South Wales, all the way down the coast, and up into the highlands, mm. Mount Bogon, and mm. into the high, where they spend the summer on that. Then they fly all the way back. So literally, that moth can fly thousands of kilometres. Melbourne Museum has an astonishing collection of moths, which is the second largest in Australia. And much of it is down to the tireless efforts of volunteers and moth experts, Peter Marriott and Marilyn Hewish. When we started working on the collection, the moth collection hadn't been really looked at for about 50 years. Peter says we'll have to live to 115 to do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd say from, um, from the look of the end of the abdomen and the antennae that that's going to be a male. Yep. Yeah, so we're just gradually working through family by family, draw by draw, sorting, getting the correct names. What kind of plants do native moths need to support and sustain them? Well, I'm taking a walk in Royal Park with volunteer Cathy Powers to find out. They need food, um, nectar, so you're going to have to have nectar producing uh, flowers. They need food plants for their larvae, so that could be anything that provides them a protection. So you could have uh, a diverse garden 
So that's really critical. Diversity, diversity, diversity. And so you could have things like bottle brushes, melaleucas, the, the, the native hibiscus would be good. Absolutely. All right. And so grevilleas. They provide a wonderful the amount of nectar. OK. And what about low, really low growing plants? Why do you need them? Well, there's a couple of reasons. And one of them is, is it provides refuge. So it, one of the reasons we don't see many moths in the wild is because they're hiding underneath yeah. there. And so the adult moth during the day will hide beneath there. And of course, seeing the beautiful mulch that's there is magnificent. Why? Well, because first of all, there are some larvae that actually eat the uh. mulch. Um, and break it down for you. Um, the other is, is that it protects the plants that are around it because it helps to protect the soil beneath it. There are some moths that actually lay their eggs in that. Okay. So it's really important. Pristine so natural garden. mulch yeah. is really a good idea. Yep. Now, what about grasses, native grasses? Well, grasses are important as well. So it provides refuge, true. It provides uh, food for your insect-eating birds mm. uh, in the seed form, but it also provides food for the moth larvae, and there are a number of them that will feed on that. This is where the mosquitoes get me when I can't move. Isn't it? Nighttime is when most moths get active, so I'm heading out with Peter, Kathy, and Marilyn to get a closer look at what's out and about in the park. We've got a white sheet. We've got a pretty bright light, 250 uh, watt, and the light is actually attracting all sorts of things, including all of these little flies that we don't want. Uh, but there are plenty of small moths just coming in because this is fairly early in the night. Marilyn, what's this one? Well, I can't tell you exactly, Jane, because it's not a moth I've ever seen before. Um, That's the first time you've ever seen a moth yes, like that? Yes, and I've seen about 1,500 species of moths in Victoria, and that one's new for me in Royal Park, right next to the CBD. That little thing there yeah. became that? Yeah. That's extraordinary. This is quite a setup, but how could people at home go about this? Well, at my place, which is an urban garden, uh, not far from the centre of the city, I set a sheet up of this size, a white sheet, and put a light in front of it, and they come. I hope you've got a newfound understanding and respect for our native moths and why we should be encouraging and protecting them. For Ken, it's one of his life's goals. And if, if moths were to suddenly just go, what would happen? 60% of the birds would disappear. Um, our pollination would be nowhere near as good. Um, there's a great saying that um, uh, Albert Einstein was supposed to have said, if the bees disappear, we will disappear in four to five years. Um, pollination is not just done by bees. Birds um, pollinate, lots of insects, and moths are your night pollinators. So without moths, the whole ecosystem would change. Literally, it would be catastrophic to lose the moths.